Welcome everyone. I want to invite you to join us this afternoon. Let you know I'm so thankful that you're here with Operation Parent and Dr. Coyer to talk about teen um, brains and technology. Um, while you're joining us, we've got a very large audience queued up today. If you want to take a, a minute and register for our next webinar with Dr. Tarada, um, focusing on body image and eating disorders. She's got a lot of great information about how to help parents tune in to how you can um, think about how you, you talk about your own body image, what you say to your teens in relation to their body image. Um, we've got a little special segment in there if you are um, a parent of athletes to think about how um, how that might be a different thought of for their nutrition and ramping up and, and those kind of things. Um, but most importantly, if, you, if we just want to welcome you, especially if you're new to Operation Parent, glad that you joined us today. Um, we've got particip participants joining us from over 45 states and a couple of countries as well. We want to let you know um, that our mission is to love and support parents by providing real world information, connection, and most importantly, hope. So we are assured that you're gonna leave here today um, with a lot of hope in terms of how you can um, impact how your teen is using technology in your own homes and just think about it uh, from a lot of different angles. I'm going to just uh, talk you through the technical components of how to participate in the program today. We're so excited for you to have a minute to ask Dr. Coyer questions uh, at the end of the presentation, so please look forward uh, to that. And also know that we are going to be giving away um, three books, three of Dr. Coyer's books at the end of the presentation. So in order to participate, just tap on that orange um, arrow at the top of your screen. We're gonna use uh, the question feature and um, all attendees are gonna be fully muted during the presentation, but we are gonna be participating together uh, during the question section. So that's about halfway down your control panel. Um, you're gonna see that section right there. You're gonna send us like both questions, comments, uh, anything you need during the presentation today, you can send it in the question section and we're gonna see that privately and um, do our best uh, to respond to you there. Uh, we've got a handout loaded for you and that handout is a copy of the slides today. So the slide presentation is available in a handout. You can click on it here while we're live and download it. Um, if you're on your phone and having trouble doing that today from the presentation, no worries. We did um, send you an email yesterday with the handout attached as well. Just um, make sure and check in a couple places for that email and know that we sent it uh, to the same email that you registered for the webinar with. Um, so enjoy those handouts. I know many of you already have that uh, printed in front of you if you're um, one of our seasoned webinar attendees. So we are uh, recording this presentation today and um, it, the recording is gonna be sent to you within 24 hours of completion of the webinar. The email um, contains uh, the recording as well as a certificate of attendance. I know many of you um, enjoy having that certificate of attendance um, just to, to have that you've completed some additional training. So just give us some time to um, get the recorded downloaded and, and sent to you. Um, there's also a short survey that's gonna be sent to you immediately following the webinar. Our uh, participants in the webinar program are so generous with their time in doing that survey. And we have gotten so much feedback along the way. So we've been at this over four and a half years um, offering this webinar program. And your feedback truly does uh, move and guide the program. So Please take, continue to take the time. If you're new to us, know that you, have, um, if you participate in that survey, we really value um, your input and we will definitely utilize it. The survey should only take you uh, three, four minutes tops. And so um, now it is just a complete pleasure for me to introduce you to Dr. Crystal Coyer, PhD. She is a therapist, a researcher, and an educator dynamite trailblazer in prevention. She's been working with adolescents 
and adults um, suffering with mental illness and behavioral problems and substance abuse uh, since 1991, a very long time. She's constantly developing new programs, so I know she's going to tell us a little bit about what she's doing um, in school systems now to reach um, teens very early on. And um, we just, we, we're so grateful for your partnership. We're also so thankful for Sherry Phillips out of Texas who made the introduction uh, of us too. And this is your second webinar with us. So thank you for being willing to come back again and continue. Um, we just can't wait to learn with you this afternoon. Mm, definitely. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it very thank much. Thank you so. so much. We appreciate your talent and your time and uh, we can't wait. Okay. Great. All right. So everybody, we can see the screen. We're good. Okay. So let me, I think I actually didn't follow the directions. I was supposed to start on that screen. But uh, So thank you guys for, for coming to this webinar today. I really appreciate it, especially if you've seen the first one that we did on risky behavior. So please know that I have done some research on about 18 different high-risk behavior to discover how they affect the brain. Technology overuse and video game addiction are two of those 18. And so in the book, uh, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide, which is done in infographic style, in color, and it's a, it's a pretty big book, just warning you, it's about 400 pages long, but it's really designed to be a guide for your child's development through elementary all the way through high school. And so a parent said to me, it's kind of like what to expect when you're expecting a tween and a teen. And so that was a really great compliment for me. But uh, it is in English and in Spanish on um, uh, Amazon. And I also read it out loud. So it's on Audible. But I just warn you, you'll be listening to me talk for about 14 hours. However, I do have a uh, a book study, a video series coming out. Uh, so if you want to get together with a group of parents in a book study, I'll have a video series that will accompany it for you. So it won't be so overwhelming as you go along. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the video series for schools later. But today we're going to really focus on, of course, three kind of sections. We're going to talk about the brain first, which I always, always do because I really believe in doing brain-based parenting and brain-based clinical work. And so we'll start with that. Then we're gonna talk about the effects of technology on the brain, and then we're gonna talk about healthy limits and boundaries. So please feel free to pop in a question in the chat. I think they're gonna help me monitor that so I can see when those will come in, or just jot your questions down so we can talk about them at the end. Okay, so I get asked this question so often. Is it really that bad? I mean, you know, I use technology as a digital babysitter when I need to, and I really want you guys to hear so many people do this. But we'll talk about screen time guidelines that are developmentally appropriate in the end, because I really want you guys to know that technology companies they spend millions of dollars trying to figure out how to get you to stay on that screen longer. And those effects really change our brain. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, brain development, I always think about the two phases that parents have to know about. The first one is from birth to about age 11, 12, puberty, when we're growing 200 billion neurons in our brain. It's like we get this big chunk of clay. We don't know what it's gonna be, but puberty kicks in the second stage of brain development. And then we start carving away that chunk until we have our masterpiece, which is the adult brain at about 25, 26, when we have 100 billion neurons left over. Now, parents, it's so critical that you understand why your child is losing neurons and what your role in that is. And so this is a really cool graphic picture of a neuron. You can see the cell body, you can see the long axon and these things at the end dendrites. What our children's brains are doing 
is it's making room in that second phase for two substances. The first one is myelin, this beautiful fatty tissue that covers the axons and allows the electrical impulse to move faster and faster down the cell. That means that our children's processing speed increases during that second stage of brain development because myelin starts to thicken. Now I want you to think about this. You want your child's processing speed to be as fast as possible, but it peaks at the age of 25. And so, you know, if you do all the processing for them, they're not going to use that. We want them to be really in charge of that piece. And so the brain is pruning away cells to make room for myelin in the second substance, which are dendrites, my favorite brain structure, because dendrites are literally the hardware of learning. And so this is what your battle cry should be as a parent dendrites, 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 because dendrites are literally the hardware of learning. Everything that our child learns or practices grows another dendrite that reaches out to another cell, making these long chains of neurons. Let me show you what it looks like. This is a little baby neuron, a little infant neuron. You can see the cell body, the long axon, and those what looks like tree branches and tree roots, those are dendrites. And as this infant grows up to the age of two, you can see the dendrites that are reaching out, the myelin that's thickening. This literally, you guys, is what a skill looks like in the brain. Now, here's what it looks like from the outside. All of this thickening and pruning and dendrite connecting is happening in our prefrontal cortex, right in front of our fore or right behind our forehead, halfway up our skull. So this is one of my favorite brain studies. You'll see this picture all over my book because it really shows you how much and where your child is developing all these connections. And that is why I titled my book, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide. So I made up a word, neuro whereabouts, because I think parents need to know where their child's neurodevelopment is, what they can do, what they can't do, and how to parent toward that. So knowing your neuro whereabouts is all about being a brain savvy, brain based parent. And so I've had many parents come in and say, like, why can't my kid do this? And I think, well, their brain's not there yet. Or a parent will say, uh, why is my kid doing this? And I think, well, that's where their brain development is. Now, I'm not saying you have to put up with risky behavior or snarky behavior, but in order to help shape behavior, knowing your kid's neuro, neuro whereabouts is really critical. And so this kind of helps you get a gauge. If you can see that frontal lobe between age five and age eight, it's really important to know we have a frontal lobe when we're younger. It's just really underdeveloped and in, immature. When we get to about age 11, 12, that's when that brain growth spurt, the second phase kicks in. Prior to age 11 or 12, your role is primarily the director. You give orders, you tell them what to do. Most of your sentences start with you, 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 you. All right. But once your child hits puberty and that second stage of brain development kicks in, it's really important to move from a director role to a trainer because now you are training in that second stage of brain development for those higher level executive functioning skills to come online. And so you can see by age 12, we've got about 10, 15% of our brain. By age 16, we've got about 45% of our brain, which is scary because we give them a license to drive with half a brain. <laughs> but by age 20, it's 80% grown, which means we have a whole fifth of brain development to go between 20 and 25. I don't know about y'all, but I thought I was grown at 17. So this was amazing to me to see this. All right. So now it's really critical. Brain savvy parents understand the brain's rule. The brain's rule is use it or lose it, which means 
the cells that you're using are the ones that grow those long connectors of dendrites. The ones that are not, literally, you guys, are being, uh, they atrophy and they just slough away as we grow and develop. So here's what I want you to think about. Here is what your frontal lobe does for you. In the first phase of brain development from birth up to about age 11, 12, we primarily grow our lower level executive functioning skills. These are the ones over here on the left that we need to wake up in the morning, get out the door, remembering to do our homework. Then when that second stage of brain development kicks in, higher level executive functioning skills really start coming online. Please know there's a lot of overlap between these, these two lists, but if you think about levels of scaffolding in the brain, right, think about that these are the first two levels of scaffolding, and then we get thicker and thicker. We want really long networks of neurons in our kid's brain for these skills, especially, you guys, the second uh, column. The second column of skills is what's known as higher level executive functioning skills. These are the skills that we need to get up and out of our parents' house, becoming fully self-supporting, uh, being healthy relational adults. Okay, so use it or lose it is really critical here. If you do all your problem solving and decision making for your kiddo, they're gonna have really, really long strings of neurons for dependency on you to do all their problem solving and decision making. This is why I suggest that you move from the director role into the trainer role. Your job is to help grow that prefrontal cortex so that it will grow up and move out of your house and not come back except to visit and bring grandkids. Okay, so this is what being a brain savvy parent is and making sure that you understand how to protect that frontal lobe as it's growing and developing. Okay, so I'm gonna move now to doing a deep dive into one of, or really two of the high risk topics that I studied for the book, specifically technology. And so here's what I want you guys to remember. Think about, if you want to get good at something, you practice, you use neurons, and you develop those connectors for those skills. And the, the kind of really cool thing about this, I want you to think about your neurons in your brain. Every single neuron is connected to about 10,000 other neurons by the time you're 25. And so those networks in there were created based upon what you were doing, what you used, what you practiced. And so what we know is that we literally start growing structure. We start growing dendrites at around three to four hours of consecutive activity. Okay, so think about that. If you wanna get really good at playing soccer, you're gonna to go to soccer practice for three or four hours, maybe two, three, four, five times a week. If you wanna get really good at debate and arguing, which kids are really good at uh, the, during that second phase of brain development, but if you wanna get professionally really good at it, you practice for three to four consecutive hours at a time. Now, you know, if, you, if, like, if you're learning a new language, right, and you practice for five minutes here or five minutes there, you're not gonna get the learning effect. But if you practice for three or four hours at a time, multiple times a week, you're gonna grow these long networks of neurons for those skills. Now, if you wanna get really good at Fortnite, play that for three or four hours consecutively at a time. If you wanna get really good at, let's say TikTok or another social media uh, activity, do that for three or four consecutive hours at a time. Okay, I think you guys are getting my point. It's not necessarily the game that's totally bad. We're gonna talk about first person shooter games and the effects that those have, but it's really how much time a child spends on it. So I want you guys to know that I am a practicing therapist and I see kids and adults of all ages. The average age of video game addict that I see is really late 20s and early 30s. And what I hear is that most of them started playing more than three or four hours a day when they were eight, nine, 10 years old, kept doing that all the way through their adolescence in their twenties. 
so their brain grew long networks for these skills rather than some of those executive functioning skills like anger management or impulse control. And that's really one of the reasons why I'm seeing more and more adult video game addicts because I'm getting referrals from child protective services that they're uh, they're losing their patience with their children. Their marriages are really in trouble because they won't get off the game and spend time with their, their partners. And so if, if you think about it, in terms of their networking in their brain. This is what their brain is not only good at, but it's also what their brain craves. So, you know, in my generation, I, you know, the internet didn't even come along until 1983. I was 13 years old and I didn't actually have my first computer until I was in my 20s. But, you know, today, especially with smartphone birth in 1992, we see that our kids are on recreational screen time seven to nine hours a day. So let me just pause here and say, what we're talking about today is recreational screen time, not necessarily academic screen time, because we know that we use computers in almost every single job there is. And so getting really good at using screens for academic and professional purposes is okay. We need our brain to be able to do that, to grow long networks of skills, because that's what we have to use today. But our brain needs a balance. It needs to grow long networks of neurons for other skills, not just this. So if you're on academic screen for eight hours and then you get off and come home and you're on a recreational screen for another eight hours, it's having a profound effect on how your brain wires and grows. So we're going to talk first about a couple of the physical effects that are happening. And this is so happened to me. I mean, I've got two different kinds of contacts in my eyes right now, but one of the physical effects is that it's causing more nearsightedness. So if you think about what nearsightedness is, it's just uh, the condition is called myopia. So if you are myoptic, then you need, uh, uh, you can't see far. So you might need glasses or contact lenses. And, and here is because we're using our nearsightedness more and more often. We're not actually driving as much. We're not going out as much. We're not interacting with the world as much. And it's literally changing our eyesight. Here is another really scary physical change that's happening. These two little, uh, they, they kind of look like worms in your brain, but they're not worms. They're a really cool part of your brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is where we store all of our memories. And what we are seeing is that the hippocampus is literally shrinking. So I put this picture in to show you how the hippocampus uh, shrinks as we get older and suffer with cognitive impairment. And so if you look at this 75 year old brain here, this is mild cognitive impairment. Most of us have this when we get that age. Some a little more than others, but uh, this is what it looks like in Alzheimer's disease. And part of the issue is we're not using that part of our brain. Remember the brain's rule, use it or lose it. If you're really, really interested in this, I would highly recommend that you look up the Notre Dame Nun studies. Beautiful information about how you can keep your brain sharp by using it for a lot of different purposes, not just those puzzles and games on, on a phone, but making sure that you continue to devote your brain to learning and studying as you age. That helps root around the damage of Alzheimer's and keeps those neurons and dendrites connected and continuing to grow uh, as we learn. But what we're seeing is we don't use our hippocampus very much anymore. So. Uh, a lot of autopsies that are being done all over the world, they always weigh different brain parts and they can see that our hippocampus is actually shrinking, which is really scary because if you think about it, like we don't really need to memorize anymore. If you want to know something, you don't have to commit it to memory. All you have to do is Google it and look it up. 
I'm constantly elbowing my husband, Google it, look it up, because I want to know and I want to know right now. But I'm not actually going through the little files in my hippocampus to pull that information out anymore. And I'm also not storing it in there because I know I don't have to. All I have to do is look it up online and I'll find it. So unfortunately, our memories are going downhill and it's having a pretty negative effect on our working memory. Now, let me just say that working memory is a really critical, pivotal executive functioning skill that starts growing in the first phase of brain development. Now, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to imagine that there's a little guy or girl in your brain who is your working memory. And for me, it's this little guy who juggles. And your working memory is the part of your brain that holds different bits of information in your attention and your awareness long enough for you to manipulate, act on, or do something about it. So my little working memory is like a juggler. And our working memory can juggle seven bits of information at a time, like really good juggler. And what happens is if we really need to commit something to memory, we focus in on it and then we dump it into our short and long-term memory stores. You know, so sometimes if I really wanna remember somebody's name in my head, I go, Nancy, 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 like four or five times and I stare at Nancy and I think, okay, now I've got Nancy's name and face, now I'm gonna dump that into my long-term memory. And the next time I'm much more likely to remember Nancy's name when I see her. If I don't really need to remember Nancy's name, my little juggler just kind of throws that ball out and replaces it with something else when I uh, uh, am, am going on about my day. But here's the deal. We have so many things competing for those seven bits of information today that it's taxing our working memory, overloading it. It's like throwing all these balls at that little juggler. And so, Here's what happens, unfortunately, is exactly that. Like we really get overwhelmed with too much information and it's hard to memorize things or learn things. We, okay, if you guys are old enough to remember this, when we went from seven digits to five, uh, 12, no, 10 digits, when we added the area code. And so uh, it was almost impossible to remember a phone number anymore because we exceeded our working memory's capacity. But with so much digital information coming in, I mean, I'm looking at two screens right now and I've got a screen uh, on my desk with my phone. I mean, there's just so much coming in. So here's how it's affecting our kids. So there's a really great researcher, I hope to meet her one day, uh, Dr. Jean Twenge. And uh, she studies the effects of technology on kids, that's her job. And she wrote this really amazing book. I highly recommend that you pick it up and read it if you're interested in this topic. It's called iGen, Why Today's Super Connected Kids Are Growing Up Less Rebellious because they're just not going out and rebelling as much anymore. More tolerant, which is a good thing, but less happy and completely unprepared for adulthood. Very scary. And here are, this was really the major finding in her book that you guys need to know about right now, is that our I generation is experiencing more depression, hopelessness, meaninglessness, and suicide risk in any other previous generation that's come before it since we've been collecting data on it. And it has everything to do with the lack of face-to-face -face time. And so it's really, really kind of interesting because it feels like we're more connected to a global digital village, but without the dopamine that comes in when we smile at people, when we give them eye contact. Like right now, I'm looking into my webcam. And so I'm imagining all of your faces out there watching this and smiling at me, hopefully trying to get that connection, but it's just not the same. So I do hope I get to meet you in person one day because then I'll get a real dopamine spike because it's a really healthy thing to be around other people, look them in the eye and smile at them. This is what our brain is hardwired for.
And because we are on screens more often, what we're seeing is depression is on the rise. Hopelessness, meaninglessness is on the rise. And so, uh, so many kids will tell me in session, you know, ooh, why would I want to do that? I have to get up and go someplace. Uh, why would I want to date somebody? Because then I have to feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, why would I want to have sex with people? Like, ooh, body fluids. I'll just stay home and be on Netflix or use pornography or do all the things that I can do online. And then they wonder why they're so anxious and why they're so depressed. They're just not getting out and tackling these feelings and learning how to overcome them and be connected to other kids. Okay, we also see that technology has a very interesting effect on anxiety. So you guys, I really, really, really love anxiety. And here's why. Because I learned a long time ago that when you feel anxious about something, it means you care about something. We don't have anxiety for no reason. It means we care. And anxiety is just low-grade fear. That's all it is. Fear of not getting something we want or fear of losing something that we have. But it ultimately means we care about it. And there's a really great book called The Upside of Stress by Kelly McMonigle. I highly recommend that you watch her TED Talk or read her book. And she talks a lot about the upside of being anxious. And there's a really cool inverted U that shows as anxiety goes up, so does performance. The key is to know when there's too much anxiety in your life and how to cope with that, because then performance does go down. But technology is having a really negative effect on this, primarily because it keeps the brain on edge. You're constantly getting up. First thing you do, look at a screen. This uh, white light, the blue light, the, the different um, uh, stimuli, they're constantly keeping our brain a little bit on edge. And so the way that this can affect kids is it can really screw up attention span. And remember that your attention span is something that is governed by the brain's rule, use it or lose it. Attention has something called practice effects, which means that if you practice paying attention, guess what? You grow long strings of neurons for paying attention, which means you can get better and better and better at paying attention longer and longer and longer. So there was this funny study that they did back in the year 2000. They measured an average adult's attention span, which back then was about 12 seconds. And then they redid the study in 2018 and found out, okay, wait, in only eight years, we lost about four seconds of attention. And apparently a goldfish can pay attention for nine seconds. I'm not sure how they measured that, but we are definitely losing our attention span. And then unfortunately, over diagnosing ADHD or ADD, and then getting on uh, medications that can have a really negative effect on our brain and our body. So I wanna tell you a quick story that I think really illustrates this. Um, uh, quite a few years ago, it was really around year 2000, I took a, a, a meditation class and uh, it was this little monk who was giving us a lesson and we did a, a 20 minute sitting meditation. And I remember uh, getting into a very uncomfortable lotus position uh, and my legs promptly falling asleep, but my mind was all over the place, which they call monkey mind. And so I remember thinking, oh my God, how am I going to sit still and pay attention to nothing for 20 whole minutes? And you could see as this 12-week meditation class went on, the class was getting smaller and smaller and smaller because people get really uncomfortable having to sit and do nothing, practice paying attention to nothing. And so and then by about week 12, I remember having this moment where all of a sudden the bell rang to indicate that the 20 minutes was over. And I went, oh my God, I, I did it. 
I didn't even feel anxious or, or, or uncomfortable. I actually paid attention to nothing and practiced meditating for a whole 20 minutes. It was really cool. And then of course I had to take the intermediate 12 week class, which is when you go up to 40 minutes of a sitting meditation afterward. And I went through the whole thing again, but this time, at about week eight and nine, I realized I could actually sit through 40 minutes of meditating with pretty good ease. And by the end of that class was really comfortable doing it. And so we know that people who meditate have really amazing neuronal networks for calming, for executive functioning skills, for anger management, emotion regulation, all about attention. So remember, attention has practice effects. So when your kids say things like, I'm bored, this is what I want you to say back. Good, practice being bored. That's a great skill to be bored. <laughs> okay, let's talk about how technology is affecting our learning. I want you to imagine your child, if you have an, uh, a high schooler, they're in class and they have a computer screen open, they have a book open, they have um, a, a couple different tabs open for different journal articles and they're reading information because they have to write a paragraph to create an essay. And then all of a sudden, ding, they get a text message. They look down and look at their phone. Guess how many minutes of learning they just lost? If you said nine minutes, you were correct. Now this is scary to me because think about uh, your typical class is about 45 minutes. If you allow cell phones in the class and uh, uh, if you text your child when they're at school, you could be the cause of them losing nine minutes of learning. And if you did it three times in one class, oh my gosh, that's half the class. It's all happened to us, right? We get distracted, we turn away, and it's like that little working memory guy who's juggling all those bits of information so we can write a paragraph, drops all the balls. We come back after the text message, after the distraction, and we have to put all of those balls back into the air in our little working memory. That takes time. It takes time for adults. It takes longer for kids to do that until their processing speed equals that of ours. So one of the best things that you can do is to support your school for no cell phones in class. If you have one of those amazing teachers who has one of the shoe racks on her door, support her, no technology in the classroom. And please, please, please don't text your kid while they're at school. Please wait until the end of the day. You know how to reach them. They can always call, the, you can call the office, get the nurse to go get them. Cut the cell phone usage off during the day so they are not tempted. Remember, they only have a certain percentage of their frontal lobe. If they're 12 years old, they have 10% impulse control. And if you give them access to the World Wide Web, they only have 10% of the impulse control you need them to have. This is why kids get in so much trouble with sexting and sending nudes. I can't, I can't tell you how much younger that is starting today. A lot of times people will ask me, well, when should my kid have a smartphone? Here's my answer, y'all ready? When their frontal lobe is smart enough to use it responsibly, that's when. And every kiddo is different. There's a really great website called Wait Till 8th. I encourage you to get a bunch of group of parents together, sign up for Wait Till 8th and hold on as long as you can. Really quick story that illustrates the power of waiting. I had a young, parent, young kid who in her group of five friends, she was the last one to get a smartphone. And she would come into session to try to manipulate me, to manipulate her parents into giving her one. And her parents were just staunch about it and said, nope, our, our job is to be your frontal lobe until you grow one of your own, so we're gonna wait. And what she started to do was she would walk into her group of friends, they'd all be on her phone and she would say, hey, you guys get off, you know I don't have a phone. They would all get off their phone and sit and talk to her. They actually said when she got her phone that they missed her leadership skills of getting them off their screen time. See what's, what they're using and what they're not losing when they're not on a screen. 
Okay, let's talk about some more effects of technology on the brain. What in the heck is popcorn brain? Okay, if you're on screens, if you're on TV, think if you're watching like a really fast action movie, when it's over, your brain doesn't just power down. You've got all those neurons that are firing electrical impulses down the brain. It takes a good hour, two hours for your brain to calm that stimulation down. And we're on screen so much now that it's creating this popcorn effect, this constant stimulation of our fast paced stream of information that keeps our brain on. That is interfering with our sleep, and it's also interfering with our nerves, our ability to calm down when we get off of technology is hampered. So we're also seeing that it's creating a state of insufficiency, constant insufficiency. If you guys have ever had email anxiety, you know what that is like. And a lot of times we experience email anxiety before vacation because we have to get through all of our emails and then in order to be able to set the out of office and go and disconnect. But then we have this feeling of unease because we know those emails are piling and piling and piling and piling up. I always feel like if I can get down and see the end of my inbox, I feel like I have accomplished something. Like my central nervous system can calm down. This is a constant state of insufficiency and gamers and social media designers know how to keep you hooked through this constant state of insufficiency. If you've ever heard of a snap streak, I cannot stand snap streaks. I actually had a client of mine pay her best friend to keep her streak up while she was in 30 days of rehab. And you can send a picture of the floor and uh, to a friend and that counts as one. And if you send a hundred pictures of the floor to your friend, you have a snap streak of a hundred. I had a client one day who came into my office and she was crying her little eyes out. And I said, what's going on? I thought for sure somebody passed or something bad happened. And she said, I lost my streak with the most popular girl in school. And when I asked her, oh, that's such a bummer. What did she say? She said, I don't know, we don't talk. So her uh, value was placed in a snap streak, not a real relationship with this person, but in how many snap streaks that she was able to maintain. Of course, you know, likes are the same way. When we're chasing likes and we don't have very many, we wonder why don't very many people like my post? As if that means something about your value and worth. Okay, let's move over to this effect gamification. Frankly, you guys, this just really irritates me because uh, it, it's happening all over again and uh, game designers, educational software designers, everybody is trying to figure out how to make boring things more fun so people will do them. And this is one of the ways. Gamification is the combining of gaming mechanics with social media, employment platforms, video games to increase motivation and productivity. This particular company, Centrical, they actually have a, uh, you can see on, on their website that they advertise that they actually do this. They actually engineer boring tasks of different uh, companies in order to make it more fun for people to actually engage. Now, in and of itself, you guys, that's not a bad idea because there's a lot of tasks that we farm out to other countries, which means jobs are leaving our country because we get too bored or they feel too menial to do them. So making them gamified, maybe not such a bad idea, but here's what happens. It creates extrinsic motivation alone. So when you do things just for the rewards or the badges or the stars or the points or whatever, you're doing what is happening is that you're creating long networks of neurons for what's in it for me and what we want to make sure is that we do a lot of things in life for extrinsic motivation but we also want to make sure we do a lot of things in life for in intrinsic motivation. Just because we love to, we're curious about it, 
we want to master something, we have a love for it, or we just want to be autonomous or belong to an organization that we have common bond with. So remember, this is not necessarily bad and unto itself, but we want to make sure that kids don't grow up just chasing external rewards, that they engage in activities and behaviors that they love to do as well to balance their brain out. Okay, so the next one is gamblification. This one really irritates me because this is combining the mechanics of gambling with social media and video games to entice users. This to me is really flat out unethical. There are more teen gambling addicts in our country than adult gambling addicts. And that has to do with your neuro whereabouts. Kids are more susceptible to chasing novel stimuli. They're uh, more susceptible to dopamine spikes, more sensitive to it. So that's why they engage in more problem gambling than adults do. And then of course, as their brain grows and develops, they learn. But these software companies are starting way too young. They use what's called predatory monetization schemes that are designed to encourage spending. So they usually start you off with, oh, it's free to play, download it, totally free. Then you get stuck. And in order to move on, you got to pay a little money. Or if you're just impulsive and you don't want to learn how to unstuck yourself, unstick yourself, then you'll pay a little bit. And it seems like such a tiny little bit of money. But please know that about 1% of people who pay are under age kids, minors who are impulsively using mom and dad's credit cards to, uh, to, to buy stuff that we really don't need to do. Now this one, loot boxes. It's really important that you teach your kids about this if they play games where they are offered a loot box because loot boxes are very similar to gambling. As a matter of fact, if there was money inside of a loot box, it would technically be gambling. But gamers can put these in without putting money in it and use a loophole in the law. Now, okay, imagine you're playing a game and you need a tool or you need some fuel or you need something and a, 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 a message pops up that says, buy a loot box, you're, uh, the item that you need might be in there. It might not. So you should buy maybe five or 11 of them because then you increase the odds of getting the item you need. Do you see how that's gambling? And we don't want our kids to engage in gambling, even pseudo gambling activity and buying things that may or may not have the items that they need. It's all about the company making more money. Now, it's important to remember that this is really an unethical activity. There are many countries, United States, Australia, a couple other ones that are actually petitioning their lawmakers to make loot boxes illegal. So if you see a petition that has one of those, please consider signing it. Okay, let's talk about video game addiction or screen or technology addiction. So as a person who is, I'm in recovery long-term from my own substance use issues that I uh, quit when I was about 18, when I was 18 years old, but it's very important for me to make sure that I do everything in balance now because Dopamine is dopamine is dopamine. I can get addicted to technology as easily as I could get addicted to drugs or alcohol. I could get addicted to eating sugar-dense, high-calorie foods or engaging in other high-risk behavior. So it's important to really understand the signs. And here's kind of a good general rule. If your child throws what's called a techno tantrum, they probably don't have a frontal lobe that is mature enough to use technology in a mature way. And that's what you can say to kids. If they are throwing a techno tantrum, they're really not ready yet to have that particular technology. Every thing should be earned, you guys. Technology screen time included. Now, please remember, I'm not talking about academic screen time. So you have to really monitor to make sure that they don't know backdoor ways of getting onto social media or uh, um, uh, chatting or things like that. So here are the signs of addiction. There's 12 things here. 
as you guys read through these, I want you to think about, uh, you know, if you have one or two of these, you may need to make some changes in screen time rules. If you be have between three and six, or your child does, you may need to actually seek a professional to help you create a plan. And if you have more than six, you may meet criteria or your child may meet criteria for video game or technology addiction. Another way that you can check is you can go to netaddiction.com. Um, there is a fantastic researcher, Dr. Young, who has been studying addiction, uh, screen addiction, technology addiction for a long time. And there's a couple quizzes on her website that are excellent. We got to remember, so this, this was this this statistic is probably about five years old, but nine back then, about nine percent of users met technology addiction, but we still don't even have a a name for it in the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental health issues because it it's not been approved yet. But just because they haven't approved it doesn't mean we don't know that this stuff is addictive. If you've ever seen a child have a techno tantrum getting off of their game, you know something's going on here. So extreme users use for 20 to 50 hours of recreational screen time a week. This is way too much. So we're going to talk about what is appropriate use here in a minute. But I want to share with you guys that in other countries, they're seeing this, especially Asian countries where there was more technological advances sooner than in our country. In Japan, they've named it Hakiki Komori syndrome. And it's a very um, unfortunate form of what they call social withdrawal that is really caused by too much screen time. One million adolescents have been diagnosed with this in Japan alone. And like I said, this is probably about five years old of statistics. It's really important that you understand this is happening all over the globe. I am seeing more and more kids who get holed up in their rooms. All they do is stay on technology all day long. Sometimes we'll see them go off to college and they get stuck either, uh, you know, instead of smoking weed all day long with their friends and dropping out, what we see is they're playing social media or video games all day long, not going to classes, and then parents don't really find out until the end of semester when they get a really terrible report card. It's very sad because in many Asian cultures, it's uh, taboo to seek help for this. And so they really kind of just get walled off and forgotten in their homes. Today, if you see these problems, please get help from a local clinician who specializes in adolescent brain. Okay, so switching from addiction issues over to how this affects our values and beliefs. This is an amazing study. Researchers had kids look at this picture, which is a picture depicting drinking and driving. Now, we all know bad behavior. But what we see is that when kids look at this picture with six likes, you can see there's some activity in their occipital lobe back there, which is where our eyes are connected to our brain. And so they're looking at that picture. And when you ask kids, okay, what do you think about this? They, they say things like, well, it's bad, like don't do it. But then when you increase the amount of likes, look what happens in the brain. Lots more activity more activity back there in this occip they're really looking to figure out okay why why are the likes going up there's some uh, activity here in their prefrontal cortex and when you ask them okay now what are you thinking kids literally say things like well maybe it's not such a bad behavior after all if most more people like it oh okay parents this is why when your kids get a social media account, you need to be their friend and spot check what they're liking, see what's going on, see what they're looking at. Research has found that the more a college student likes pictures of drinking, the more likely they are to have problems with drinking in college and as an adult because of the everybody does it norm effect. When you see a lot of people liking something, it makes you think it's okay. And I think you guys know that kids can glamorize the most unglamorous high-risk behavior, not okay to do that, 
but it's up to us as parents to teach him that it's not okay to think in that way. Okay, let's move into solution and then get your questions ready. So some actionable steps for you guys. Establish rules early. And if you realize, oops, I didn't establish enough, it's never, ever too late to go back and say, ugh, this is not working out. Remember, your extinction burst, how long it's going to take for them to temper tantrum about this is going to be longer the longer you wait. So early establishment is good. So in my book, in uh, many of the sections, digital dangers is in every single chapter, elementary, middle, high school, and in the tools section. Now in my tools section, I have an outline of the brain balance rule. Here's the brain balance rule. If your child earns two hours of recreational screen time on Saturday, once their two hours is used, now they have to go find something else to do for two hours to balance their brain. So think about it. They're going to grow some networks for a fortnight, but they're also going to grow some networks for going out inside and playing with the neighbors. This is something that you can say to them is we're going to follow the brain balance rule. Another thing you can do is create a family code that includes your expectation of how they act on and offline. What we didn't talk about today are the effects of bullying and cyberbullying. I have a whole hour presentation about that because of the research is so, so depth or um, in depth. And so it's important that you set in your family code the expectation that you treat other people with kindness, compassion, and respect on and offline. And that also means caring for your brain and its development. Make sure that you don't text your kids during school hours. One of the best things that you can do is get software on your phone so that you can turn a phone off at any time you want. There are some really great apps out there. I have some uh, references in my book for those that actually, if you see that your child is texting and driving, you can shut their uh, cell phone uh, Wi-Fi uh, provider off right at that moment. If you know they're gonna be in school between seven and three, please shut their phone off. This will help them make the decision not to get on impulsively when their frontal lobe does not have enough power to do that. Okay, so um, let's talk about screen time guidelines. And I have this in the book as well, but it's, you can find this on the American Pediatric Society's website. It's really important that we do not expose our kids' brains to screens too early. If you put a child in a playpen when she's, um, you know, a year old and you're singing and you're talking or you're reading and the TV's on, guess what they're going to be paying attention to? They're going to be paying attention to fast-moving, supernormal stimuli from the TV. Their brains can't handle that. And so the uh, American Pediatric Society says that even between 18 and 24 months, no less, like less than an hour a day, but it should be co-viewed so that you can use it as a teaching tool. It's really better to be staring at your kid all day long if you can, having them attached to your body. And when they're not attached, being able to sing and talk to them while you're doing the dishes, while, you're, uh, uh, while they're playing. That is so much more helpful to their brain development. And then, of course, in elementary school, uh, what we recommend is no recreational tech time during the week. None during the week when school is in. And if you can keep it out of the week during other times in the summer, it's best to stay with the same structure. And then they have to earn screen time when they're in elementary school no more than one or two hours consecutively when they're in middle school, no more than two to three hours consecutively, and when they're in high school, no more than three hours consecutively in one given day, and they should all earn it. So if you're in elementary school, you have to earn half an hour at a time. If you're in middle, you have to earn an hour at a time, but never more than two to three hours consecutively. If they know that that's the rule ahead of time, you will be much more likely to have them follow it as they grow. Now, when kids say, oh my God, I'm so bored, please put the activity pyramid on your fridge and say, yeah, it's great to be bored. What are you gonna do about it? 
And if they say, I don't know, what could I do? Ask them, hey, go to the activity pyramid. Remember, you don't have to solve those kids' problems for them. If they solve them on their own, they get to grow long strings of neurons for problem solving and the activity pyramid can help. So this was published by the MU Extension at the University of Missouri, Columbia. They gave me permission to actually put it in my tool section in the book. Please feel free to tear it out, put it on the fridge, and then it tells you how much of different activity the body and the mind need during the week. And just like the food pyramid, right? Okay, here's an example of a family code. The family code activity building exercise is actually in the book. And then make sure that you teach your kids how to be a good digital citizen. So please know that this is all in the book in different chapters. I think this one is in a middle school chapter. Make sure that you teach your kids what that means. Common Sense Media is a really great website that has a lot of these things on it. But if you just go through and say, okay, this is what it means to be a digital user in the call your family. This is our code. This is how we treat other people with uh, compassion and respect and kindness on and offline. This is what we do. This is what we do not do. And here will be your consequence if you choose to engage in inappropriate behavior. Not only will you use lose the screen, but you'll also lose other privileges too. Some good nutrition. Please have detox weekends. Your kids will hate it you will hate it but please do something together turn off your phones and screens for a whole weekend or at least a day like digital detox day and uh, what studies show is when you even just watch tv um, it actually has a different effect on your brain than engaging in a video game your brain is really really active popcorn brains going on but when you shut your brain off and even just watch TV or watch movies together, it's still a much different activity in your brain. Brain balance rule. It's better to go camping or go outside, but if you're like our friends in Orlando or Florida right now, you're you're like, if you don't have access to that, uh, it's a great time to actually be together as a family and go do something positive while you're waiting out the storm. Okay, some really important things is to keep technology out of kids' rooms for as long as possible. Make sure they know how to use real alarm clocks. It's a great skill for them. There's a lot of skills building scripts in my book to help you build executive functioning skills and be a brain savvy parent. If you don't know what to say on a daily basis to use brain-based praise, these are there for you. Now, if your kiddo has engaged in a behavior they're not supposed to be, that's when they should earn some paper in their life. And when I say paper, I mean that's when they go on a contract. Now we contract with our kids all the time. We say, if you do this, you earn that. If you do that, you will earn this uh, a consequence, right? So I don't like to use the word punishment. It's not a really great shaper of human behavior, but rewards and consequences are. You earn rewards for behavior and you get a consequence by losing those rewards if you go against that. A really good example of a contract in the book and then there's a conversation starter calendar. So you can use this for prevention purposes and conversations with your kids. When your child, when their frontal lobe is uh, mature enough to earn a smartphone, I would start with a dumb phone first with no access to the, the, the World Wide Web. Because please know, if your child receives a picture of a naked picture or a sext from another child, your school will be obligated to call the authorities on this. This is not something that you want to do. I just uh, helped a school figure this out, how to do this the other day, because three uh, fifth graders were involved in an activity like this. It's very important that when they earn any kind of an electronic, that they get a contract and you go over this contract, they sign it. It stays up somewhere in their room where they can see it. You can refer to it often and let them know you own it which means they don't you don't, uh, uh, they can't say no when you ask for it. When you want it to be off, they also can't say no. Please maintain control of that phone. If they think they have control of that phone, they'll go out and buy another one without you even knowing. Okay. What can schools do? Definitely no cell phone in the classroom. Create healthy technology policies. This is tough because many schools have 
hundreds of parents who get so angry when they have no cell phone rules. And so unfortunately, the schools lose out. They have to accommodate the parents who think that they absolutely have to have cell phones. And if you really want your child to have one so you can find them, I totally understand that, but please turn it off during learning hours because they don't need, you don't need to text them during the day, during their hours. Now, let me just share with you too, something that I'm doing with the 18 different topics that are in my book, I'm creating a online uh, video series, uh, social and emotional and prevention videos. K through two gets their own videos, three through five gets theirs and six through 12 gets theirs. So they're out about a minute and a half, three minutes, six minute videos with one page handouts that teachers can use in the classroom or you can use at home to discuss, quiz, sing, do fun activities with your kids on these different topics. Technology overuse and video game addiction are two of the topics that you'll find. So if you're interested in piloting any of that as I'm creating it over this year, please do. Also putting together a really cool video series book studies for parents so that you can have me and some of my voice and support as you're going through reading this guide so that you'll know what to do when your child moves into a different stage of brain development. Okay, so here is our time for questions for Q&A. And so I'm going to ask um, uh, Michelle if she sees any questions that have come over in the chat yet. Ah, there's so she is. many questions. Oh, so many. Um, thank you so much for giving us so many things to think about and utilize in our own homes. Um, you've, you've given us a lot of ideas along the way, but can you give us one highlight on how we um, also compensate for the amount of screen time that our kids have in school today? So they spend the majority of their day at school on screens. Um, as well. And so we probably need to be even uh, more vigilant about less um, screen time at home. So can you give us a, a highlight yeah. pointer for that? Sure. So I think that making sure that no recreational screen time happens during the week, uh, you know, that kids are in uh, pro-social activities. I think kids are way over scheduled today. So, it, you know, I mean, I've got kids who are in three different activities and they have no time for homework. Uh, making sure that you have Homework time is out in the open so that the screen is not in behind a closed door and making sure that uh, bedtime is at a certain time. And if you don't finish your homework by that time, too bad. You gotta learn how to negotiate and do time management. And so uh, you don't have to compensate. What you have to mm. do is just provide structure and limits about it and letting them know the brain balance rule. And so if they've been on a screen all day at school, they may not want to be on a screen at home to do homework, but they may have to be. So you may not be able to compensate for it, but just setting up brain balance rules and appropriate use, detox days, making sure that their cell phone does not go into the room with them at night, keeping a cell phone basket out so that everybody puts it in during dinner. And, um, and of course, providing good consequences so that when they misuse it, they lose it. Mm -hmm. And isn't it isn't it true too? I know sometimes with the busy schedules, we're passing on that dinner time around the table. You know, just trying to get that done as many times as you can during the week. It's just a really valuable connection yep. time. Very uh, much. So. Yeah, I love that idea of like putting the cell phones away from the table. It's so good. Exactly. Put that away. Yes. Um, okay. So. Let's see, I'll try and kind of organize these in um, age, age range. So we'll okay. start with an elementary question. Okay. Um, is there an age range when intrinsic motivation develops? So this parent is working uh, with their eight-year-old um, to move them away from it's, it's all about me. So um, what, do you, what do you say to an elementary parent who wants their, um, son or daughter to think a little beyond themselves. Ah, so remember that in elementary school, we're primarily thinking with concrete egocentric thinking. That is normal for that age. It's not abnormal. And so what I would encourage you to do more of 
is to ask for empathy because empathy is a higher level skill, but they can still demonstrate it when they're younger. And so when kids are thinking all about me, they're kind of supposed to be thinking all about me, but don't shame them. Make sure you say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm hearing that you're considering your point of view, but what about my point of view? What do you think she would feel if you did that? How might this affect her? Asking the empathy questions once or twice a day is not um, inappropriate, but then when they give you a good answer, use brain-based praise and be able to say, oh, I love that thinking. I love how you thought about that. That was really sweet and considerate of you. Praise what you want to see. Don't shame or lecture about what you don't, right? So you want to kind of ignore the behavior that you uh, want to see decrease unless it's uh, harmful. You never want to ignore harmful behavior, but if they're just being self-centered little, you know, <clears throat> then instead of shaming that, you know, being able to say, okay, I hear what you think about you, but what about someone else? And then mm -hmm. just know that you're going to be working on that for quite a few years as their brain grows and uses more abstract reasoning. And please know you're also working against the selfie me generation where everything is about them and getting more likes and getting more attention. That's not necessarily bad. This is the generation that we're growing up in, but use brain-based parenting to increase executive functioning skills. Oh, it's awesome. You really trained us well in our last webinar to think about using that brain-based praise like as much and whenever we, we can. And um, it's been amazing in my own home to just see you know, sometimes you just try and get down to business and like this, but like pausing and really like when you see, when I see my daughters do something really amazing to make sure that we say it out loud um, and they just light up. And so when we have to connect on some harder things, you know, it makes it a bit easier. So I, I would um, encourage everyone to just practice that as much as you can, a little more than maybe you're even doing it already to um, keep the hope alive in your Oh, Michelle, your you just made my day. You are officially a brain savvy parent. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm getting there. I'm working, working hard on it for sure. Um, you want to talk about an, a 13 year old based question next? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so when you trained us or you talked to us a bit ago about the director role to the trainer role. So that's where we're we're moving our um, kiddos, right? So yep, yep. what if your child, and this parent actually says, let's say they're age 13, refuses this transition, or maybe they're a little stuck from, from going there. Um, how do you work, get your child to work with you as their kind of their trainer and a little less of like, they feel like they know it all um, so that there's just a, a good back and forth uh, flow there. Okay, they're going to feel like they know it all for a long time. And please know that around age 11, 12, 13, their amygdala is completely online. This is the part of the brain that gets angry, that emotional, that pushes away, and their nucleus accumbens is starting to seek more novelty. But yet their frontal lobe is only 10 to 15% online. That means they have a fully developed accelerator, but only a partly developed brake. So what you're seeing is normal although it's really irritating and annoying. This is just a tough part. It's in the middle school chapter where I talk about the gap, the gap between IQ and EQ. It's always gonna be there, but the brain's rule, use it or lose it, can be on your side. So it's important to know if they're refusing to follow rules, that's not okay. You may have to start to institute a behavior modification contract and shape their behavior with consequences. So I can't stand it when parents say your punishment is, because okay. please know a punishment is an aversive stimuli. We're not doing that. We're giving them real life consequences and rewards. If you go to school, if you do these behaviors, you will earn these rewards. If you don't follow these rules, then you lose these rewards. That is consequences. And most kids today, that. Uh, scratch that, many kids today get everything that they want without having to earn it. And that creates a sense of entitlement 
And those kids have a lack of autonomy. They're stuck between a rock and a hard place of being very, very uh, angry at mom and dad because uh, they didn't make them earn anything. And then they can't be mad at mom and dad because they didn't make them earn anything. And so this is an emotional place. It's not a healthy place for kids. It's really healthy to teach them what they can and can't do. And when they refuse to follow rules, which all kids do at certain times, that's the time when you have to actually really get very consistent in shaping behavior with contract, with rewards and, and consequences. So that that blank contract and the example contract are in chapter six in the book. There's, there's so many tools all throughout your book. Um, I was just looking before we went on again at, at page 219. So I know there's some folks out there that have the book already, um, but the, the information on technology is awesome. And being able to listen to it after you read it on Audible, I'm so glad you went through the exercise, which I knew took a lot of time uh, to do the Audible version, because it helps it really, like you get to think about it from a lot of different angles when you, you read it and then you, um, listen to it as well and it's your voice which is which is awesome awesome thank um, you so another thing you you cover really well in your book is um the addiction to just general um technology but as well as social media and um this parent is asking like would you make the leap to say this is why students are paying less attention in general and specifically in school, less attention to teachers' simple directions. Yes. Like they're having a hard time following um, the simple stuff. Absolutely. And I mean, COVID regressed a lot of kids, you know, so, um, you know, I had a high school teacher say to the parents, you know, your ninth graders or seventh graders because of the lack of using their brain during COVID. And, you know, she was even saying that uh, after a test, many kids were getting up out of class and walking down the halls. And she was saying, wait, what? why are you walking down the hall? And they're like, well, I did that when I was at home. When I finished class, I just went and did what I wanted to do. That to me is a lack of using their brain to, to follow certain rules and limits. And so, you know, um, using the use it or lose it rule is really empowering to parents because if you know that following directions is, is something your child is struggling with, making sure that you at home say, let's sit down and make a plan because you got in trouble at school for not following directions. I had a teacher tell me yesterday that she gave feedback to a child and the child on his paper actually literally said, these comments you made are stupid. This is not appropriate way for kids to be talking to adults or really anyone. But a lot of times what we see is parents are not teaching these things. And so we, we, we've got to re-empower and re-energize our parenting to jump in and say, hey, kiddo, I, I know that you don't want to follow the rules, but if you don't, you're going to lose these rewards. It will suck to be you if that's what you choose to do. A lot of times I see parents try to power struggle with their kids, and you've seen the power struggle worm in, in the book, in, in the in middle school chapter. Don't bite power struggles. Get really good at not biting those, at knowing when kids dangle them in the water, and just simply say, this is what you earn if you choose well, this is what you earn if you choose poorly. Ah, oh, you've segued into our next question perfectly. So an eight-year-old is having a hard time letting go of the phone at bedtime. And so I know in my own home that bedtime time might some days be the only time you have to connect. If you've had a real busy day or you've been at um, athletic events till late or, or whatnot. And so um, getting that bedtime to be more peaceful for the parent who asked that question. Okay, one, it's an eight-year-old who's already struggling with yeah. that. And two, like that's an important time as a parent for you to settle down and start to get into your relaxed um, state. So what would you offer as help yeah, there? So let me just say right off the bat that I, I really disagree with eight-year-olds having phones that young. And I really hope it's not a smartphone. If it's a dumb phone, okay, I get that. But it's really important that if a child does not follow a technology rule, that they lose the technology. So if you 
already have agreed that your child at eight years old can have a phone, it is extremely important they know that giving it back is not an option. If they choose not to put it away or to put it in the basket at night, then they lose it for a week. And then that's how you shape behavior. I think, Michelle, our next parent focus or next webinar should be all about behavior modification and how oh, to shape yes. human and animal behavior because it's the same exact principles. But I think a lot of, we don't get taught this. There's no parenting school that says here how to shape human behavior. Here's how to teach kids how to follow the rules. And so, but please know that you own that. And so if they don't follow the rules, they don't get to have that reward. Mm -hmm. um, that is awesome advice and an excellent next webinar topic. I love it. I love it so much. Um, okay, let's see if we can squeeze in maybe one more that's related. Okay, how about this? So um, a parent was asking, like you mentioned a lot of great resources throughout the webinar, and I've highlighted five of them. So they were asking just for like Dr. Jean Twang's book. Yes. T W E N G E. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think and she um, pronounces it Twingy. Yes. It's and she's okay, got thank such you. a great website. Yes. Okay. And then I also wanted to um, add Wait Till Eight. Yep. Is that the actual website? They could go yeah, to waittill8.com. Wait yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Good. And then uh, the TED Talk. Ups, upside of Being Anxious. Uh, upside of Stress by Kelly McMonagall. Uh -huh. Okay. Perfect. And then um, netaddiction.com. Oh, another. yes, Dr. Dr. Uh, Kelly Young. She is amazing. Her research is fantastic. And there's she's got great quizzes on her website. Okay, perfect. Um, someone asked that you direct them to how to get your book in Spanish. Oh, so it is on um, uh, Amazon. So if, it, you know, if you go to Amazon, you can look up a Guía de la Neurolocalización. Um, if you can't, find it, uh, typing it in Spanish, you can find Dr. Crystal, call your author. You go to my author page on Amazon and you'll see links to both of them. Okay, perfect. And we have a link um, to the book in the follow-up email as well, just so folks know. So if you go there, you can also um, go beyond that and look for the Spanish version. Great. We also have a Spanish version of the Operation Parent Handbook. And so we've, we've encouraged folks in our last webinar, and I'll say it again, to think about if you really want to um, upgrade your prevention power for the fall, Think about getting these books in, a, in like a bundle, like order Dr. Coyer's book as well as order an Operation Parent Handbook. And we're going to tell you about a special offer here in just a moment. Um, and then we're all going to give the three books, copies of your book away. Um, so I think we've gotten through a lot of great questions and covered so much ground. Um, so why don't we move on to the Operation Parent slides to close out, unless you have any final thoughts for the group, Dr. Coyer. Uh, no, I just wanted to say, you know, if, if anybody wants to go to my website, drcrystalcollier.com, um, I've got, and, and email me uh, if you want to pilot some of my uh, my video uh, curriculum, I would be glad to do that for, send them to you for free in exchange for feedback. And if you go to the books website, uh, neurowhereaboutsguide.com, all of my reference, or my, my resource pages are free um, on, on my website as well. Oh gosh, that's amazing. Um, we just wanted to let folks know in the Operation Parent Handbook, many of you already have it if you want to go to the elementary. So the elementary is a new addition and we've got some great add-ons in there about gaming. So I'm glad that you touched on gaming today. We are also trying to, to toggle on that as well. Uh, the middle and high book, we've got great information on social media apps and, and sexting um, in there as well. You know, I feel so hopeful after talking with you today as a parent, even though my teens are getting a bit older now, um, I still have great techniques that I can use uh, with them to empower our connection time. Um, you know, hope is at the core of our mission at Operation Parent, and we believe that our handbooks will empower and instill hope. Um, by continuing to provide up-to-date information and tips about how to support teens. 
Um, we're so committed to continuing to reach out to parents that we're connecting with great experts like you all over the country. And um, we appreciate how deep you've gone with us today. I wanted to ask if um, anybody has a recommendation for a presenter that's equally as awesome as Dr. Coyer, feel free to put that in the survey. That's how we connected with you. And we'd like to um, continue to connect with others. But then also, I just wanted to add to like, we're so committed to getting these handbooks and getting great information, your information also in front of parents, that we have um, moved our model to be able to offer free shipping um, to families. So if you um, are interested in taking advantage of our webinar offer today, I want to show you um, what that might look like. So even if you are um, purchasing a bulk order from Operation Parent, you still qualify for the free shipping and you will receive a, a special offer from us as well. Um, so why don't we go ahead and give away the three copies of the book. It looks like we might have a little bit of delay on our slides, but that's not a problem at all. If you're um, still hanging with us and you're interested in a free copy of Dr. Coyer's book, if you could put your full name, and your full address uh, in the question section. We are going to uh, pick the winners and then we'll put that announcement out on our social media tomorrow in terms of the first name and the state uh, where the winners um, are joining us from. All right, and then um, you're also gonna get 20% off um, a individual handbook or a bulk order if you enter fall 20 at operation parent backslash shop um, today on our handbooks so thank thanks everyone so much for joining us keep parenting and hopefully you've already registered for um, dr tarada's webinar and then in the future you'll come and uh, join us again when dr coyer comes back and works with us on behavior modification thank you so much hope you enjoy the rest of your day Take care, Dr. Coyer. Thanks. You got it. All right. Take care. Bye, guys. See ya.